I would like to start with the show. So, um, welcome to the 120th, this crazy, 120 hours of AX TV, 120th edition of AX TV. And today with uh, lots of interesting topics. And uh, the first one is uh, caused the uh, delay. Or oh, he's from Krakow in Poland. So I was in Krakow very often. I don't know why, but in Krakow, there are maybe the uh, most conferences in uh, in Europe, I would say. Sometimes, you know, there's like uh, two big conferences in a row, like the Geekon and the DevOps Poland, for instance. So I don't know. I was in Krakow maybe 20 times, I think. And Gdansk is, um, this is I think, number two. So this is the two cities. Um, Cologne, not not bad. So Cologne is the JCon conference. So oh, uh, I have to plan the travel, otherwise I won't make it. So Cologne was a good tip. So, and um, today with the with the first topic from the from Twitter, is how would you book real world Java patents? Rethinking best practice look like in 2024. And uh, so I tried to find a book and I found it. So, but this was the reason for the delay. And um, and uh, here is the book. So it was from 2009, and uh, so I wanted to reread it, but um, it is really boring uh, to read your own book. So um, instead, what I would like to do is to uh, sh briefly walk um, through the through the agenda and say, okay, what's the difference to now? And uh, by the way, a um, little story about the book. Um, so why I wanted to write it, I don't know anymore, actually. Why? I think the problem back then is that everyone said that Java E or Java E back then is bloated. And for me, it was lean and fast. And I said, okay, then I will write about what I'm actually doing. And uh, from for me, you know, the best ever publisher was O'Reilly. I really like O'Reilly. Tim O'Reilly was an old Java once. So I asked O'Reilly. And they surprisingly said, yes, uh, you got a contract. So uh, the book was uh, Real World Java e Patents, I think the name, or maybe it was this name or different name, uh, was supposed to uh, to uh, to be uh, written for O'Reilly. And, and, um, and yeah, it worked. For first chapter, it worked, the, hist the brief history of J2E. And uh, and then something strange happened. My editor and O'Reilly said, uh, what I'm writing is not true. And I say, what are, what are you telling? As he said that uh, EJBs were before applets. And I say, this is not possible. I mean, this is, I said, yes, it was the case and I have to change it. It's like, I won't change it because I know that the applets came be before EJB. And, uh, and then it was back and forth. And then he said something like, uh, your book is not good enough, and could we cancel the contract? So, okay. So, we cancel the contract, and then I uh, say, okay, then A Press would be my second choice. So, I Java One, I think not the same one, um, but I, or I wrote, I think I, I'm, I wrote an email to them and asked, you know, what about book Java E and Java E patterns? And they say, uh, and they said something like, yeah, "Java books, Java is no more interesting. This was 2009. Uh, is you know, uh, is not uh, interesting language. So we have different languages who are more popular. And Java, no one is interested in Java anymore. So okay, this is a pity. I th I thought. And then I uh, got the idea. I would really like to write the book. And I have and and uh, I had really b bad experience with a uh, bad experience with the publishers. I didn't wanted to discuss. I want I wanted to write a book, right? So, um, and I said, okay, then I will self-publish the book. So I don't care. And then I hired, I think for this book, someone from Adobe, he was my editor. And uh, I wrote the book and the book was crazy successful actually. And what happened then is I got actually asked uh, uh, by A-Press whether they are uh, allowed, you know, to, uh, to reprint my book. I was like, why now? I mean, and, and I got, um, I think from, all major publishers. I'm not sure about O'Reilly, but uh, everyone asked you know to, to have the book. So this is the interesting story behind the scenes about real world Java e patterns. Or so you hear this now first. Maybe I I reveal it on some conferences, but uh, uh, I'm usually you know there's no time for such a thing. 
So, and now let's see what happened in 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 um, in chat. And this is crazy. By, by the way, we should start this like in Java one. You know, who uh, who um, who is from where? And uh, ne next question is you know who attended at least one AXTV two and three and four. This was like a tradition at Java one. Grimly is from Paris. Uh, interesting. And uh, oh, RFX says Krakow is great. Vavel and Rinek. And there is an, a dragon in in in, in Krakow which uh, spits fire. And uh, the interesting part is, um, if I would you know, uh, organize a conference in Krakow, I would call it DragonCon or something like this. And I talked to organizers and they told, tell me, this is a great idea actually. It's like, yeah, but I mean, you are from Krakow, you have to know it, right? <laughs> so um, now, um, Uh, uh, for Bitnal, uh, Grimly, yes, I think uh, Grimly asked me whether there will be no null in Java. I'm pretty sure they are working on, on it right now. So this would be like something like optional, you know, optional built in. Okay, now, uh, what brief history of J2E? So obviously, I, I really forgot what I've written, uh, just looking at the agenda. So uh, the rise and fall of applets. And if you know, if you think about this now, actually, we could mention applets, and it's a little bit far far away, but it comes back and forth, back and forth. And I would say, all the craziness with Wasm in browser is not far away from applets, right? So I would say, um, <laughs> full circle. Then ultra thin clients uh, moving beyond applets. Then uh, the the entire discussion regarding consistency, I would say, up to date. And by the way, JCon. Uh, not JCon, um, JAX conference, sorry. Uh, JCon is similar, but there is a JAX conference, a big JAX conference, JAX conference in Germany. And um, maybe I will find this. Wait a sec. This is now interactive. Um, Adam Bean, JAX, EJB, serverless. Uh, reject all. So uh, first, uh, this is... Uh, Oh, it maybe this, this, this is in German, but lots of cookies here. So, and my topics are, well, where is this? Speak out and bean, okay. And the talks are EJB developer is the first one. And uh, then you are also great serverless developer. What I will do in this talk is actually, I will explain AWS Lambda and serverless technology with Java and EJB for me is the same. The same concepts. If you know about EJB's pooling, you know, um, uh, the proxies and AOP, you can actually explain one to one Lambda very well. Um, I did it once in the pandemic time uh, for uh, DevFlix, was a conference. And the next one is YAML less, config less, boilerplate less, serverless enterprise, Java. And this is the same spirit as the book. So as you can see, I would say the the book would be very similar. What would be different? EJB, so EJB now, you would use CDI, introducing consistency. JMS is problematic. I mean, the API is perfect. Oh, okay, what's the difference between back then and now? May, oh man, if I will explain this, this show will take two hours, but a short version of it. What I liked about Java E and what I like right now about clouds is the same. So what I really appreciate about Java E that I'm, I'm singleton consultant, I could actually understand all the servers. This was the trick. I learned the API and then I could be productive. And the in, the idea was that I can actually, you know, package my application, which is lean, and there is a runtime somewhere, and I can I can I can push the runtime to the application server at it and it runs, right? This was the idea. And uh, by the way, on, on conferences, how I introduce myself, like, you know, uh, about DevOps, and it is true story. So I've, as I started, you know, at the very beginning, it was uh, before Java, and then it, with in, then Java happened. And uh, we were in a backend project, content management system, and we were asking, you know, which service should we buy? And this we got the server. It so I look, the server is here. Now you have, you know, to install everything on the server. And uh, we had uh, like Solaris clone. I forgot actually the uh, the the uh, manufacturer and uh, HP because of HP dealer. So we get a big H HP server. So we installed every everything on the server. And then after a while, you know, 
uh, a different department took over and we are not allowed to use the server directly. So we were serverless. This was the story, right? And um, so, so the consistency is, uh, uh, is still important. And right now, for instance, I'm working with DynamoDB and S3. And uh, I would say, if you know EJBs, you already know where the problems are. And uh, the, the thinking is, I would say, identical. So now to JMS. Why JMS is problematic? I like JMS a lot back then and try to avoid JMS right now. Why? Because back then, the clusters were managed by another department. I only had you know, to register my listeners. And by the way, some mes message listener were way easier to deploy than AWS Lambda, for instance. In fact, right? It was one method, four lines of XML, or one annotation, and you were done, right? So this is way easier. But um, so, but very so. For instance, um, AWS Lambda is almost identical to JMS idea. But the problem is nowadays in projects, if I have to implement something, it's not just about business logic. I'm also in charge of the infrastructure, and in this particular case, I don't like you know in every project to set up JMS cluster, and I also I don't like to set up Kafka clusters in my projects. I'm not interested in it. So I mean. I'm really interested in it, but it's not the point. So I usually, and my clients are asking about having a complete solution and not, not for me, you know, to code something. So, and the comp complete solution means you have to be done, you know, in two months or three months. And, um, and, and, and if you consider everything, so I, I try to avoid infrastructure. So what means is right now, um, so uh, Jan had uh, asked a question. Uh, isn't DynamoDB a vendor locked in? Yes. Um, this is another story, but don't ask me such questions because we will talk to, 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 to <laughs> tomorrow morning. Um, this is the next thing. Um, yeah, Let's keep the vendor. Uh, maybe this will be a great question for the next AIX TV. Um, but uh, um, what to do with your vendor? Um, the vendor lock-in, we have to discuss maybe vendor locking. But let's see. Uh, so we have to cover the, the the book first so and um, the java blend is like jpa uh but was not that successful and um so then i actually this this chapter was pretty cool cool i, I could actually pick it one to one it just you know um the, the explain what transactions are and then the java e core concept convention of configuration dependency injection aspect oriented uh, interceptors for instance and um, this is interesting so this both could remain the same and by the way, this book would be more about serverless right now because this is the logical successor to Java E. Not necessary Kubernetes. This is not the same rather than a step forward, um, serverless. And um, so, and aspect oriented programming interceptors are interesting because back then I would implement this as interceptor. And right now, they are usually in the cloud implemented before the server is even hit. For instance, an HTTP API ha handler, what we did recently, we implemented a, a specific authorization routes on HTTP API handler, and, and what we got on the server was just a token, nothing else, for instance, right? Um, or caching usually happens before the server gets hit. So um, then JPA, okay, and now, and now, to Jan, now, now I have to, I have to, <laughs> I have to um, um, explain it. So I don't use JPA a lot nowadays, not because I don't like the, um, hi, <laughs> you are late. Uh, so you don't get, what, what you don't get, a certificate maybe, right? So there should be a punishment. So aspect-oriented programming and interceptors. Uh, about vendor vendor lock-in, Ex exactly. So JPA is great. JPA abstracts from Hibernate and um, and uh, Eclipse Link and uh, Open JPA and the others. And um, but if you think about this nowadays, this is not a problem to abstract from Hibernate and Open JPA. Or I would say, the migration is possible because the applications are simpler. The problem right now is the infrastructure. This is my problem, actually. So if I'm a project and someone asks me, you know, do something for me, it is also implies it should be also a cheap solution. 
So this is it's not like we can do whatever we like. So what we, okay. <laughs> in in the cloud, the cloud architecture for me, if you like search for talks like code uh, cost-driven architecture, I would say the architecture in the cloud has to be cost-effective, otherwise forget it. And the problem is relational database are crazy expensive. They are orders of magnitude more expensive under enterprise load. Enterprise load means, you know, nine to five and uh, vacations, right? So um, in this particular end, they are also easy, uh, very hard or very hard. They are harder to provision. So even it is easier to provision an RDS uh, Postgres uh, or, or Aurora Postgres, it is far easier to use DynamoDB or 3, for instance, far easier. And um, so what it means is the convenience and speed and costs outweigh you know, the vendor neutrality. And regarding uh, DynamoDB vendor log in the end, you are absolutely right, but Cassandra is very similar, for instance. The same concepts apply in Cassandra and DynamoDB. Cassandra was actually um, built um, from the DynamoDB papers, right? And by the way, if you're interested in it, um, watch EIXFM, uh, just a hint, right? So I have an interesting chat about uh, that, exactly that. Um, how Cassandra happened will be possibly the uh, the title of the thing. Um yeah, how exactly, Grimly? How much pay, pain you want for on infra and in serverless is no pain, and anything else is almost ridiculous if you think about this, right? So if we were time, I will show you. you now, usually I start my cloud workshops with explaining what VPC is, subnets, and then usually you know most of the developers say this is crazy, but uh, yeah, and serverless nothing. You just push the stuff. Okay, so there are different modes. So um, maybe I mean. This could be interesting if you are on premise in public cloud. I will look. I will pick DynamoDB. I would start with S3. If this doesn't work, DynamoDB, and if this doesn't work, um, yeah, then see what works because then you have very specific solution. And in uh, Asia, the same. Uh, I will look, take a first look uh, um, look at uh, Blob Storage or um, Cosmos DB. So now rethinking uh, the uh, business tier, and this would be almost identical. So there is a, like a boundary service facade. I don't call it service facade. I mean, there is a service application service, exactly that, but I don't call it the application service. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is just, you know, natural. That is self-evident. There is no need to describe which this is like the, the class looks a little bit different, but it's uh, very similar. So let's go quick quickly. Um, persistent domain object, business object. Actually, I'm working with DynamoDB right now. And what I use is Java records for it, and uh, even Java records with sealed interfaces, which are automatically mapped from DynamoDB. And this works surprisingly well. So such patterns I would describe as well. Because I would focus more on the cloud, because this is written, if I would just update the book, I would just focus more on micro profile, because it, all these relevant specs are micro profile, and also cover Jakarta E, of course, but micro profile is new, right? So uh, cover more stuff and um, so the gateway was a stateful um, 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 a stateful pattern and uh, but still relevant not for JSF interestingly more for AI length chain for J for instance what you need you have already converse, conversational memory where you can talk you talk to different LLMs you get to you know the data back and you do something with it. So the gateway could be interesting for complete different reasons. But um, yeah, and by the way, LangChain um, um, uh, integrates very good with Quarkus, for instance. So then uh, let's see what we have. Uh, fluid logic is uh, yeah, like using, um, uh, for instance, um, DSL likes. And I, I forgot what I did. Uh, I think I use uh, JavaScript uh, with Nashorn, I guess. Uh, I'm not sure anymore. But uh, you could do the same, and we still do it with GraalVM, for instance. And um, in AI, again, uh, you could run uh, JavaScript and, and uh, Python functions for uh, for OpenAI, for instance, right? So um, still the same. So Paginator and Fastlane Reader. So Paginator became really important, not for the user data, but if you are working with S3 or DynamoDB, everything in cloud has a limit, so you have to always paginate, actually. Without pagination, forget it. And pagination is always ugly, so paginator still on top, you know, but not for user interface. 
So, um, and interestingly, I always talk about testing back then, 2009. So this is, uh, yeah. And, okay, retired patents. Oh, great, service locator. So 2009, I retired. Cool. Value object assembler, business delegate. Oh, business delegate. Um, I would um, I would reboot it So um, because I use it for complete different purpose right now. I use business delegates in testing. I injecting tests to make them reusable, for instance, a lot, actually in all projects. Um, um, okay, domain store is retired because we have um, because we had got entity uh, manager. So uh, rethinking so uh, DAO access. Um, so there are lots of DAOs, but I, I hopefully I wrote that you don't need the DAOs. Transfer object. Okay, so I would say uh, JCA. Um, this is almost gone. Most of the integration happens via REST interfaces, but it's still challenging. So um, I would explain here, for instance, using MicroProfile REST client with fault tolerance. And by the way, also generic JCA, think about this, you know, in the LLM world, if you talk to Mistral, Olama, OpenAI, they, they're all, they have different APIs. So I think something like Java connector architecture, LLM connector architecture could be interesting, right? So uh, service activator was um, asynchronous communication. I would say this is um, almost you know natural right now with uh, Java 21. And of course, what I will also mention is uh, is virtual threads, um, right? Okay, so let's see. And infrastructural patterns, what was it? Um, oh, service starters, this is like no um, startup annotation. So forget it. Uh, singleton is just singleton and... Uh, so dependency injection, this is like a, all these all these patents are dead because of CDI, and uh, and this basically was. So I would say the ideas I use every day. So it's not like it is retired. I just use it and don't think about it. So the book became you know Linux or Z shell. I just write ls, and it works. Okay. Now I have to read what you actually wrote. So let's see what happened here. Um, so something like warehouse management system should never run in the cloud. Why not? Uh, actually, it's what what you can do. You can bu you can buy uh, buy um, Azure Stack, or I always forget the AWS name for it. It's not uh, Snowflake. It's uh, it's different outposts or AWS outposts. And uh, actually, my client's doing this, and you 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 get the service is like a blades, and they are managed by someone by by AWS, but they're running in your in your data warehouse, so it it could make sense. Um, so um, and WM asked me, is there a more lightweight way to instantiate Java records without calling a huge constructor with one hundred parameters if eighty eighty of eighty of the parameters are optional? Um, 100 parameters is a little bit tough. So I, what I will do, I would write, an, you could nest records. This is the way to go. Not like 100, but you have maybe 10 Java records with 10 parameters, which is fine. Yeah, Jan, you're right. Uh, but I, I know what, uh, I have I have sometimes a problem, WM. This is a valid question. Because uh, recently I had an, uh, an, an record with one optional parameter. And I thought, okay, what to do, right? Um, should I? And what I did at the end of the day, uh, I, I uh, implement. So what you can always do, you can have a static create method or constructor or how to call it, a, a static factory method, exactly, with less parameters. And then you call constructor with nulls, for instance. You can do this, but I didn't want it to use null. So I use optional, which is also a little bit strange as a parameter, but it worked well enough in this, this particular case, but it's not a best practice at all. Um, yeah, Timeless, I think uh, it, should, it could be, I think there should be two books, and they will be completely different. Real-world Java e patterns on-premise and real-world Java e patterns in the cloud. And this would be complete contrary, contrary, you know, uh, point of view. This on-premise would talk about vendor neutrality, and this in the cloud, about you know managed services and absolutely not vendor neutrality because if I'm going to the cloud, I'm already absolutely depending on the cloud. So um, I would just be as efficient as possible in the cloud, and on premise 
I would like to be, you know, as fast as possible. You have different or and maybe maybe cheaper. Usually, always cheaper on premise, right? On premise is usually always cheaper, and um, but the 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 architectures are completely contrary. So uh, on premise, I would still you know use JPA to decouple because the database are basically free. I use Postgres, Kafka, whatever in the cloud. I would never use Kafka, for instance, if if not necessary. I would try to use SQS, SNS, um, Kinesis because it's already there. One second, I have the queue. Pay as you go, and for enterprise applications, it's fairly cheap. DynamoDB, I can just you know create a table with full security with Java during deployment. There is nothing to set up, so it's, I'm orders of magnitude more efficient. And with Java, I can uh, I can um, implement the entire infrastructure on the go. Okay. Um, okay. With more than five components, I use the builder pattern. Grimly, with Java records, it's harder the the uh, builder pattern because you have you know to to specify all the components up front. But uh, what you can have is multiple st static factory methods, and yeah. But um, yeah, WM. I know. So if if you have such a thing, yeah. What you can do, right? Uh, with 100 parameters, it's tough, but then you have to automate the project somehow. And um, um, yeah, I have to think about this. So uh, find a solution. Okay, I think we're done with the book. Uh, and I forgot actually what the next topic is. And I don't have to know about that because, okay, this was the, the talk. And uh, this was the book. And now the excellent question from Grimly. He asked me on Discord because I forgot to create a gist. And um, so uh, what I understood from your question is you're asking me if I consider Kubernetes as an engine, not as a runtime, right? So how it is built. And um, so I, I give you my answer. And if this was not the question, so you can re-ask now. So I think Kubernetes is excellent. So really, and why? Because all the patterns are already built in. So what Kubernetes ships with is etcd, which is a um, key value uh, database, which is great. And you could even use it directly, right? So it's not supposed to, but could work. And what Kubernetes is doing is, uh, I mean, you all know what it is doing, so you can, you know, uh, it has, actually, Kubernetes is an, 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 an complete operational cloud. So if you have Kubernetes, you have everything, right? And therefore, the question is, do you think that if we remove anything DevOps, I mean, in, there is nothing DevOps in Kubernetes usually, right? This is additional plugins related from the industry could use that instead of reinventing our old REST APIs again and again. So um, and um, so and and what I also like what uh, Grimly mentioned is the. Um, the resource definitions, custom resource CRDs is not uh, is are custom resource definitions, and if you're building products, you can. So how this works? So Kubernetes is a kind of command line interface, and think about CRDs. You can have your own commands, right? So and if you issue this, this is like um, a schema definition almost, and uh, if you issue the command, you can do. More magic. For instance, this is like almost like a DSL. You can say, "I would like to start, you know, all the servers in this order." If someone issues the command, this is with Kubernetes, which is great. So now, for on, on premise, this is the way to go. I mean, what you can do, right? So I mean, just pick Kubernetes. And by the way, I would never use Kubernetes from scratch because it's like building Linux from source code. <laughs> Just uh, I would use uh, SUSE, uh, uh, SUSE Rancher, uh, Rancher or um, OpenShift on premise, and this is the way to go. For instance, on, oh, OpenShift, I use OpenShift a lot. It was great experience, and Rancher also, uh, also nice. And but what I mentioned is that Kubernetes is a complete cloud, and this is the problem, because if I run Kubernetes in the cloud, now I have two clouds, I have care about. So therefore. In the public cloud, I never use Kubernetes, I have to admit. I always, you know, if they, my clients ask me about Kubernetes, if I show them the costs and the alternatives, I'd, Kubernetes just died. And um, so this is also a story. So I think if you just pick, you know, native managed services of a cloud, they are 
more efficient than Kubernetes, easier to run, and there's no duplication. Du duplication. So running Kubernetes uh, in the cloud, for me, is the same conceptually like running, for instance, Spring Boot, Spring Boot on Quarkus, right? You could do this, but why? Right? So this is... That's... Grimly, I hope I answered your question, but uh, if, you if you like to... to, to um, so Kubernetes are great inspiration. So if you're building your own distributed system, take a look at uh, Kubernetes and you can learn a lot, right? But business projects in the cloud is not about learning, <laughs> it's about... Uh, writing simple stuff which works, right? Okay. Uh, WM, what's... Yeah, yeah, Lombok. You could use Lombok uh, to generate code, of course. I try to avoid it, but yeah. Um, but I, I don't know whether you could use Lombok to generate Java records. I mean, you, you could, but how to specify that? So, yeah. So uh, Tito Sanchez asked me, I remember you mentioned once something like patents are a solution for a problem. If you don't have the problem, you don't need need the solution. I guess the name to run... Yes. Uh, if, if you... If you uh, Tito, if you, if you are asking me um, whether you should go to the cloud, my answer is no. If you're happy with your on-premise servers, I will never go to the cloud if you... If this is the the question, so so the the, the exactly, so um I told the, the the actually the story multiple times. Um, we uh, we are in the cloud because we have to in all my projects, and uh, um, in one project my client just insists to be in the cloud. They have no idea why, but all the other clients have actually reasons to be in the cloud. Yeah, in, in one project they just decided now we have to migrate everything to the cloud, and they have no idea why. If you ask them, it's, it's decided. Okay. And all the other clients, they have uh, disaster re disaster recovery problems, uh, d um, challenges, or security, you know, regulation and stuff like that. And cloud is just better. So Tito, you are right. And uh, yeah, it would be interesting where you uh, where you had to, uh, where I said it would be interesting, right? So Grimly again, my question was: uh, Imagine CRD with a business object, not an infra thing. And this is actually, I don't know, uh, Grimly, if you saw, you know, my Quarko CDK template. Uh, so what I usually do is uh, we are shipping in the cloud one project with the CDK included, and this is go going to be better and better. Um, ah, thank you. But, you know, um, great, that, you know, great times that you remember, and, you know, and, and, and the ping me is also always, you know, uh, a nice touch. So um, I, I hope... We covered Kubernetes, um, and Kubernetes is really interesting because it works like, you know, you ship the state to the Kubernetes, and reconciliation happens, and and what, what happens then is the uh, Kubernetes, I forgot uh, the, the, master, the, the, the mastermind, but they are like worker nodes, and the one thing is the big reconciliator, call, call it that way. It just tries, you know, to achieve the state. And this is the the best idea ever. It is not API calls. It's more like yeah. you de de define you know the. It should be one cluster with two nodes. You upload it, and it's the case. And by the way, in the serverless, exactly the same. I use CloudFormation indirectly, which is CDK. I define I would like to have this function. I ship it to the cloud, and AWS you know performs the magic, and is on the end of the day like it should be. So it is actually exactly the same idea without Kubernetes. Okay. And by the way, I think CloudFormation was first. I don't know whether the CloudFormation was first, but the uh, Fargate was ECS was uh, before Kubernetes. So this is what what I know. Okay, pretty cool. So we covered this. Then we have uh, an, an, a nice question: Why do you waste your time and energy by using VS Code instead of IntelliJ? So uh, first. The energy part, you are right. I think Visual Studio Code could consume more energy than uh, IntelliJ because IntelliJ is written in Swing, which is highly efficient, and uh, Visual Studio Code is um, is a, a, basically a browser which is less efficient. So I'm wasting a little bit of energy, but uh, yeah, I could buy some. Oh, by the way, this is the reason why I introduced three hacks, right? So if we go, wait a second. Because I'm wasting the energy, there is a website, what's uh, Airhex Industries? And there are tree hacks. And therefore, I'm planting trees 
you know, to offset my energy waste. And by the way, I have to plant more. I forgot it. Actually, after every workshop, I plant uh, some trees and I wa actually wanted to to implement an API to make it automatically. But uh, yeah, so, so the energy waste done, right? About efficiency. So um, how I'm usu usually working here, yeah? so I'll go here to Ahex TV. So uh, let's say, so I have, um, so first I open, you know, the uh, the Visual Studio code like that in any folder I like. You, you saw this was an empty folder and could create a file and say index HTML and then say HTML5 and then I'm in, right? So uh, this is just uh, experience without, without, uh, out of the box, right? So this is the first one. You say, okay, but we are Java. So first, you know, the entire HTML and JavaScript is great. Now, uh, what about Java? So what I'm doing with Java, similar, set up Java project, Java project, and uh, let's call it yeah, TV. So now Visual Studio Code opens with POM, this is my POM with code completion, Java 21. I have a nice terminal and can say clean uh, package, not project. Package. And everything is clean. Or I can use, you know, the Maven built-in, which I don't like. I don't like the built-in Mavens. And here I can run my thing, and it runs here my thing. So it is a bit, I mean, I would like... If they would be just Java, I will keep using NetBeans. But uh, this, it, it, I have to audit, you know, edit Markdown, and I have, you know, to use JavaScript. And this is, you know, it's just uh, Visual Studio Code is great. And you ask me about, you know, the DSLs. So, uh, so I now call it uh, ALS, like serverless. Now it opens two windows: one with the infrastructure, which defines. Um, which defines here, for instance, API Gateway, uh, which is infrastructure as code. And I could deploy this, what I usually do at conferences if someone asks me, to the cloud immediately. So I, I think I'm extremely productive with Visual Studio Code. Now, the question is, uh, when to use IntelliJ? And the answer is, I was in big projects and we had to do refactorings and um, and IntelliJ just shines. And what IntelliJ also does, it understands your code very deeply. So you can even manipulate um, the ASTs and what we also did. So there are crazy stuff in IntelliJ. So if I would be in big enterprise project and I have to refactor lots of stuff uh, from legacy to Java 21, I will use IntelliJ. But right now I'm in modern projects. Um, maybe you spotted here, you know, there is my... I have direct access to AWS log files, and, and it's just very convenient. And by the way, all the great plugins come first to Visual Studio Code. Like uh, I could, uh, from the beginning, uh, from the one that was available, I could you know try out Copilot or was available, and it comes later to other IDEs. So I don't think I'm wasting lots of time, but there is a challenge, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ayub. Um, Mr. Ayub, I'm recording daily shorts with Java, and I managed to do it under 60 seconds. So maybe you find something to say, okay, with IntelliJ would be faster or better or whatever. So you should you should find something which you say, okay, I'm really slow with Visual Studio Code, and if IntelliJ, I will be orders of magnitude faster, right? So because 10%, no one is interested in it, right? So um, so this is why, uh, um, yeah, this is what. What I wanted to tell you that I am I like Visual Studio Code and I know that IntelliJ is more powerful and but and also whatever I did right now you could do it as well if you clone my you know Quarkus CDK project and open it with Visual Studio Code which is completely free you get the same experience so but I'm constantly experimenting with other editors and by the way. I have the tool toolbox um, subscription for uh, for JetBrains. I have all the products, and from time to time I launch, you know, to, uh, IntelliJ to see different colors. So I, I I pay for license 
for for the toolbox license and 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 uh, use uh, test web stores from time to time. And what I use a lot is the um, data product. Uh, they have uh, an, 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 an database uh, development product. I forgot the name. Okay. Now. E yes, but which API you would like to... Uh, The problem is also what change. Right now, I have to consume lots of existing APIs, so I don't have too much freedom, you know. And uh, for the for the front ends, we just implement whatever makes sense, right? This is yeah. Okay, uh, Grimly, I think. But uh, if you if you if you think about the product and so forth, CRD. For the infrastructure, so we already have it. This is called stack. For the business, if you if you think about CRD like a crowd, so you so you will pick. I, I don't know. Um, I, I I don't know or forgot. Actually, we built once a CRD, but I forgot how the API looks like. But um, if you think this is consistent, we could use just the CRD API. Wait, wait a second. Maybe we can find it very quickly. Uh, Kubernetes. Uh, CRD REST API. Let's see. Yeah, this is what I'm not interested. But where, where the API? So I, I think I'm not a huge YAML friend. So if I see this, I already know my <laughs> my excitement is a little bit lower. But we have to find the API. I forgot actually how it looks like. But if it looks great, we could we could be inspired, pick the CRD API. Of course, I would have nothing against it. Why not? I mean, better standard. Yeah, just do it. Now, uh, data grip. Exactly. This is the data grip. And Grimly types from an iPhone. So kudos to you. So you are a young teenager. So you can do it. You know, you can swiping and, and writing. And I like just keyboard. I'm also younger teenager, but uh, I, I still prefer, you know, the keyboard. So, um, so regarding web components, um, how often your customers decide to go for web components instead of JS frameworks? Actually, in my recent projects, always. So this and 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 why? Because if you show them, there's no reason to use frameworks if you, if you because, okay. Um, there was a misunderstanding in management. Was managers are thinking that if you are using a framework, JS framework, it will look great, and usually the framework has no look and feel, and uh, they, so you have to do, to pick uh, uh, the components anyway, and usually the frameworks pick web components as components, and the only distinction is that uh, I'm using a web components to structure the application, plus from time to time components which. <laughs> <laughs> provide more look and feel. So, um, and um, Z, um, so the Z is cool, but uh, the Z, okay, the Z, Z is sleeping right now, but um, the Z has no um, Java support right now, so that's the problem with the Z. Okay, um, a developer market, yeah, uh, yeah. Angular, I would, Angular dies slowly, which is good, and React now is uh, really big in enterprise. Uh, also, a little bit late, but I think right now this year, like uh, web components are up to date. I would say uh, there are lots of projects switching to pure web components, and uh, lots of articles that uh, Vanilla JS is a thing. So I would say everything actually. Web components are in good shape, right? I would say it's getting um, so. And Vardin Flow or Wicked or Family uh, are better. And uh, this is behind the heart, but I think you mean HTMX. Uh, cannot see this because of the heart. Let's uh, push the heart. So I think HTMX is uh, RPX is nothing better. The problem in the cloud, if I do timely wicket or whatever, I have still the problem with the load balancer and where to run it. It cannot be serverless, right? So this is this is the main problem. So bigger problem, but it could be a question for the next show. 
So, uh, yeah. Now, uh, what else? Let's see. We are slow today, I, and I completely lost. Uh, okay, and is Java E failing, uh, falling from, from favor? And... Um, I would say uh, absolutely not. Actually, I use Java E. Uh, the, actually, the code in my current project is almost identical to the, to the code from the books. There are no, no more EGBs. It's a CDI. In serverless, everything is application scope. I use inject so Java E all the time. But I don't talk about this a lot because, I mean, lo mo most of my projects are running on, all of my projects are running on Linux, but I also don't mention Linux a lot because it's just there, right? So... Now quickly, Time Machine. So we have to do this. Uh, this interesting one, it is from 2015. So what Time Machine is, this was the episode 20, exactly 100 episodes um, uh, before before this one. And um, and the first question is, how do you compare OOP with functional programming and increasing trend with functional? So also back then, right? So I've asked me, you know, uh, OOP and functional, the same questions right now. I would say most of my project, even back then, were not 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 functional it was even st structured programming i had just you know static methods more or less uh, like egbs if you if you think about egbs they were just independent methods right so it could be static um uh yeah well i mean java gets more and more more and more functional and the entire stream api i would say it is functional and and both have their merits and now i would also ask you know what's about data oriented programming um, which is uh, a new paradigm, which is functional, which is fully supported in Java. So I had uh, also an episode, if you're interested, on AHXFM uh, with Jose about data-oriented programming, which is ba <laughs> um, a hard guess. So we almost fight, fight it, um, I know, uh, to... Um, 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 if if you wanted to you know to um, to explain or or actually there was um, I was I explained why OOP is great and uh, Jose explained why dope is dope right data oriented programming is great and uh, it ended up uh, almost in a fight um, okay then um, database access in uh, SaaS environments one database per user um, by the way this is nine years ago if you are with lambdas this is exactly the problem you have one one connections per user. And this is why it doesn't scale. So if you use serverless environments and you have relational databases, you need something in between, um, like RDS proxy, for instance. And um, yeah, uh, so recommendations to ensure high performance, high availability in Java EE applications. So um, so what what changed maybe? This is the trend or trend is fact. So the availability in the cloud happens in storage. And if you have cloud native database, compute and storage are decoupled so it means you know the storage is almost like something s3 based usually behind the scenes and the storage replicates the data between you know availability zones and even regions and the database sits on the storage so this is how um, high availability is solved in the cloud and on premise you can use a neon database for instance is also serverless postgres and um, and uh, high performance and with tests right and uh, I mean, obvious things don't block, synchronize, and so forth. <laughs> SOAP, and I think there's no more SOAP. So, REST with pro proxies, JSON over, JSON over DTOs. Yeah, this is, I think, reality. In most of my projects, I even, you know, prefer JSON P over JSON B because it's more flexible. And with Java records, it just, just works very good. Beginner's Guide to Application Servers. You, you got it, right? We reviewed my book. So, I th actually, uh, we, we, we got that. Watch this, how to separate control from boundary in a real world example. So still, you know, valid question. And uh, my BCE design with web components is boundary control, is still up to date. Uh, Maven release plugin, um, don't use it anymore. Uh, why? Because it doesn't matter. Uh, we don't release, you know, uh, to Maven repository. If you're running in the cloud, usually you will uh, release, you know, the Docker images or uh, the function zips or CDK jars. And uh, yeah, by the way, session ID mechanism between web app and JavaScript client. We had to do this recently because we had to integrate web components into JSF. So this was um, funny. Um, uh, Hazelcast in Java E. So uh, Hazelcast is a great little framework. It's in memory uh, grid and uh, how to integrate it with Java E. 
I mean, you have to boot it somewhere in startup and uh, yeah, and then you are done. Or use Payara, it comes with Hazelcast built in. And uh, by the way, in, in, in I think October 2015, there was an air hacks both at Java One a live show, and we covered you know all the uh, programming, uh, yeah, uh, OP languages. And back then I was asked different questions of Kotlin rather than Scala, I, I, I guess. But um, I just keep doing Java, and now I get the same questions, you know, nine years later. Um, and mixing primaries with various JavaScript frameworks, then um, it works, but you have to be cautious. You know, there should be no interference. Okay, this was the time machine from back then. And by the way, I think you will like the no dependency show or how Rive2 and BLD happened because uh, Hiat and uh, Eric, this show comes later. So Hiat has actually created a really interesting um, uh, Rive web framework and BLD uh, builder and the builder is like a maven, but uh, it's completely different. So what you do is you write your main methods and you just call, you know, the build methods and it builds itself. So crazy story. And during, you know, the episode, I think you will enjoy it. Um, we find out that actually I'm coming from a completely different uh, direction from Java E and, and here from Java SE, but we both don't like dependencies. And this is what happens, right? Um, okay. So now... We have this. Okay, what what happened here? I just extended the agenda. I think I will use in serverless length chain and in persistence patterns uh, some uh, uh, concrete Java implementations. I can actually show you uh, with uh, what I to uh, exactly what I told you with you know with um, interfaces and um, and uh, Java records, for instance, and data oriented programming. Actually, 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 <laughs> data oriented programming with uh, NoSQL databases. Um, this is basically it. So uh, what happens here? So, um, yeah, JSF was great. I mean, uh, uh, you, you have JSF. You can just use it. And, and uh, by the way, this Rife thing is really interesting. So uh, I will look at this. Uh, not Maybe not use it in, in real world projects, but uh, yeah. Uh, Payara Cloud, of course, Payara Cloud, but uh, you won't see uh, Hazelcast. You will just use Hazelcast. Uh, that we need better end-to-end -end tests and more frequent releases? I mean, this is what we need, right? <laughs> this is like, you will ask, you know, we need keyboard for development, right? So and this is a tough one, but end-to-end -end tests... I mean, without end-to-end -end tests, forget it. To just go first. And uh, frequent releases. Okay, what um, I plan to do in uh, my current project, I have more, more powers. So we will have releases without releases. This is this is a new... I need a catchy, uh, catchy word for it. And what is release without release? It means that um, we will force releases twice a week, even if nothing changed. Because, you know, to make sure that all the dependencies and the cloud is working, what if the cloud changes the API? So we we would like, you know, to release, but it's fully automated. But uh, I will force my clients to do this. Uh, I think it's a good idea. Otherwise, you know, um, if you don't do a release for a year and then, um, you know, everything changes, you know, the operating system or the machine changes or the um, uh, in the cloud as well, the services are independent from each other. Okay. Um, you could use uh, a code coverage with end-to-end -end tests. Um, yeah, three-month cycle. Maybe you should have releases which are not visible to the users, right? So this would be the trick. So you release often, but it's uh, like a integration stage release and not production. This this could be a solution. And. Uh, what you can use, you can use something like Playwright, for instance, a nice uh, test framework for front-ends, and uh, sell it as automation tool to see, you know, what your application is doing, even a presentation tool, and use it also for automation. So this is uh, this works usually better. Okay, one hour, I have to go, but your job is, there are lots of questions, you know, behind the questions, right? So you have five, I, I will try to publish the gist earlier, 
so then file you know all the questions uh, leftovers from today and see you in one month and yeah it was a great show and that the book was not a that good idea because there were lots of stuff but um yeah next time you know um more i will focus more on chat so thank you a lot and see you next time bye